Welcome, everyone. Uh, there's a lot of lights here. Jesus. Um, like one thing, uh, I, the title of this, as you can see, is Moneyball, Mo Moneyball Generation. Who here has seen the Moneyball, the movie? Like, I hope you've seen it, yeah. <laughs> All right, good. Good. Um, who here has seen Generation, the movie? No, I'm just joking. Um, but the idea here, we're going to talk about sports a bit, sports and tech, uh, and how it all comes together. What's the future of it? What, how big of a business is it? It's actually quite interesting if you're into sports or even if you're not into sports, if you're in business, into business. Uh, and who better to have for this than the CEO of maybe the most famous Croatian sports-related company, if we can get a tech sports-related yeah. company, SofaScore, Josip Stuhli. Josip, welcome and give us a little bit of background, maybe you, but also let's maybe for, like, okay, let's just start this one. Who here has SofaScore on their phone right now? Jesus. I think this is done. We can go. <laughs> this is no need for this. Uh, all right. Just give us, for those few people that don't have SofaScore, give us a few brief introduction about the company, what it does, and also how you ended up there. Sure. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, welcome. Um, it's great to be here. So SofaScore is basically a company that produces an app. Uh, which enables sport fans to follow different sports. We have 24 different sports, and we deliver real-time updates for those sports. So you can follow um, scores, statistics, um, you can chat about those games and stuff like that. The company um, was self-funded. Uh, two guys, guys from a small village near Zagreb founded it. Um, with zero investments. What's the name of the village? It's Klinchasela. Okay, Klinchasela. It's an exit on the highway. I had to get up there. Yeah, a few yeah times. exactly. Um, and basically, I was the first employee. Um, and it happened by chance. Um, it was an ad on a forum that said, we need developers. And I said, okay. So me and one other guy, we started working. Um, and then he left. I stayed. Um, another guy came. Then he left. I stayed. All together now is four guys in a company. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so currently we have um, 230, more than 230 people worldwide. Most of those are in Croatia. So all of the development is done here in Croatia. Uh, most of the people are from Zagreb. Um, but we also have people from different parts of Croatia. Perfect. So uh, I can see a lot of people on their phones. So they're downloading SofaScore for sure. Uh, it's available in all the stores, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. We also had Windows Phone Store, <laughs> but it's dead now. So, <laughs> but it's like a it's like a cool story. So maybe even uh, useful for some of you that might um, start your own companies. So we started the Windows Phone app, and it was just one developer, and he was designing and developing and testing and everything, and it got on its own without any marketing. The app had one million um, monthly active users, and like all of those people went away because Windows Phone died, um, but they all transferred to a different platform. So um, some of them ended up installing the iOS app, and some of them ended up installing the Android app. So it was like a really good marketing for us because we instantly got a lot of users that were already familiar with the app and. Um, uh, they gave good scores. Um, so, yeah, that's the lesson. Build first on a Windows phone and then you're yeah. going to get customers. Um, no, but like, uh, speaking of users and, uh, you know, active users, again, for those few people maybe that don't know, how many downloads, how many users, how many active users you have at SofaScore? Yeah, so downloads, I'm not even sure. I know we passed the 50 million mark on Android. Um, <laughs> But th this is not something we actively track. So uh, across all platforms, more than 50, probably under 100. I'm not, I'm not sure. But what we do track is the number of monthly active users. So that, that's an important metric for us. And uh, currently, we are at 25 million monthly active users. Um, they're all over the world. Um, so it's, it, you kind of get these interesting challenges to solve. Um, business-wise and also technical, because you can, we cannot shut down the app to do some maintenance or whatever. So the servers always have to be on. 
because when you have people in Croatia, when they, they sleep, you have the US and Brazil, and when they sleep, you have Asia and so on. So it's, it's always on. And, and uh, speaking of different countries, where do you have, like, you give us some data about the users. Where do you have most users? Where do you have least users? With which markets you are maybe penetrated in a successful way? Which one maybe was surprising? Like something that like, exploded, but you didn't expect it or something? Yeah, so the, the number one country is Brazil, which makes sense because they're really into football. Um, like extremely into football. They did good at the World Cup. They were pretty yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, Quarterfinals exactly. or something, yeah. Yeah, so that's the number one country. And then we have Italy. And also we have Haiti, which was, which I, I we honestly, we still don't know why. <laughs> it's just like the fourth country on the list. Wait, we have, uh, we do zero marketing. Haiti, like the yeah. island. Yeah, wow. yeah, exactly. It's like, Probably the whole island, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, sports in terms, how many sports do you have on the platform? How many sports um, do you cover? Currently it's 24. 24. And yeah, the last one was MMA. Um, okay. We also have the, the brand ambassador now is uh, Crow Cup, Mirko. He's a really cool guy. The, mo the most famous uh, Croatian in Japan. Croatian, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the only non-most famous footballer in Japan, whatever, Croatian, that's not a footballer. Uh, so uh, all the sports, 24 sports, I'm not going to even ask, football being number one, two, three, four, who are the second? So tennis, basketball, and then American football and uh, American sports. And right after that, rugby, because rugby is the best sports. In the the best sports? So, yeah. yeah. Now, anyways, but uh, so give us a little bit of background as well on the technology side. How did you guys develop? What challenges do you have on the tech side there with the tech stack, with how big, how big is your developer force out of the 200 and something people? So the whole development, including the QA, is 70 people now. Um, I mean, the challenges are interesting to solve. Um, so we have, I don't know if you're familiar with the term DDoS. So it's a dis distributed denial of service. That's kind of what we do to ourselves. Each time there is a big game that's being played because we send out millions of push notifications and the people, they just open up the app and they all want to see the results at the same time. So basically we do a DDoS on ourselves, so it's really tricky to deal with that. Um, we, we, we had to um, like talk with Cloudflare, which is our CDN, to put special rules for us so that they don't trigger the DDoS rules because they kept blocking our users just because of the sheer volume, yeah. Um, the tech stack is, I, I'm, I'm gonna say maybe unconventional for, for today. So our backend is written in PHP, which like most of the time people are what the f... Um, but you have to remember... We can swear here, it's fine. Yeah, yeah no because way. like Facebook was written in PHP, so you know, it, it can, you, can, you can do it. Um, we also have some Golang, um, no Java, we have Node.js for server-side rendering. Um, we have React on the front end. We have um, Kotlin on Android and Swift on the iOS. It's a pretty complicated affair, I think, there, especially with the, with the real timeliness there of, of, the, of your product. But um, I'll take a step back and ask a little bit about the industry. And maybe this industry, I mean, everyone's into sports, everyone follows sports. But, you know, here in Europe, in the U.S., in Brazil, but maybe we don't know, how do you see it from the perspective of a provider or of SofaScore, like, of a size of industry? I, I call it the sports entertainment industry. Like, how big is it when you do your calculations on the finance side, when you monetize, and how you monetize, how do you see this industry growing? How big is it, and where does it go? Yeah, I mean, it's huge. I've... I think I read somewhere when you encapsulate the whole industry, it's in the hundreds of billions of dollars. So it, it's a huge industry. We are currently not the number one player and we have a really large user base. And that's just a portion of the entire sports entertainment. Right? We have a fan engagement platform basically, which is just a small portion of the whole industry. Um, I mean, you have VAR in football now, um, in soccer. Um, you have variables um, that 
can collect huge amounts of data, but it's all still on the, on the edges. It's, it still hasn't penetrated the, the mainstream. Um, but we do have a lot of data. So for example, we have for, for the most popular leagues, we have more than 200 metrics, uh, 200 statistics for each player. So that's a lot oh, of... Real time? Yeah, I mean, mostly um, within a couple of minutes. So that, that's also an interesting thing to do because you have to, like, it's not being done by AI. The AI is, there's no, the computer vision is still and not on par. People are leaving the room. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that's the way it is. Yeah. So, like, the companies that provide you with the data, they don't do it automatically. So they hire um, ex-gamers just because of how their reflexes, how fast their reflexes are, and they follow the stream in, in real time, and then they click around on the screen. And you have to have really good hand-eye coordination to do so um, efficiently. For and example, in football, what do you click around for? Like you, contact, you, you, duels, or...? Yeah, like you, you follow a certain player, and then you plot out their coordinates, x, y, on the, on the field, what action they took, in which direction it was, there's a lot of lot of data, so we we ha we can we actually generate heat maps based off of that data. But it, those like for for each player, and there's lots of players, um, you have more than 200 stati statistics that are being generated all the time. So that, that's a lot of data. How many people, in that case, are necessary to follow one game of football? Like on the other end, on the manual part. Well, a couple. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we we actually don't do it ourselves. So that yeah. data. Uh, we buy that data. There, there are um, data providers where you can um, buy a league data from them. So we buy everything that we can, but at a certain point you just reach it. There, there is nothing else left to buy. So what we do is we aggregate all of that data to get this unified experience where you, you, where you get the most out of the data and we analyze the data and then um, show it in a different way. And then when you cannot buy uh, anymore, um, so we scrape all of the official data sources, and then that's not enough. Uh, we also do, we have a whole team dedicated to just entering the data. They have their uh, app where, for example, you have like lower leagues which write their results on Facebook pages, which is not structured in any way. So we have people who can read that and then input to our system. Oh, wow. There's, there's a lot of manual work. Do you think, speaking of AI, speaking of advancements in technology, that on the data supply side, the, the, the process will be much more automatic in the coming years? Like yeah. Like image I'm, recognition, you know, following players. By I, I think it will. So there are some solutions. Um, the problem is you have to have it um, done professionally. So you have to have, uh, like, I think it's eight cameras all around the stadium, which does, it doesn't scale and to parse the image, the stream, which is available to me and you, um, it's just too difficult. There have been some attempts, but currently it's just, it's not viable. I think in the future it will be. Um, we will get to that point, but not in the next couple of years. All right, I have a, I have a stupid fan question. Like, so you say there's a person on the data supply side, there's an ex-gamer who's tracking the player. And then they have to click something and move the mouse in the direction and so on. And then I'm on the other end watching the game, and there's a penalty where my team is about to concede a penalty. And I'm like, there's always this little hope there's not going to be scored. And then I get a notification that the op opposition team scored, and it was before the penalty actually happened on TV. How does that happen? So we have this magic algorithm that can predict the score. <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm kidding. So the, the, the TV stream is um, encoded a couple of times, so I think it has a delay of maybe 30 seconds to a minute until it reaches you, and that's enough time for the data um, to be seen by a human. It's, they're actually on the stadium itself, so they are inputting the data right away, and it's being sent to one server, and then to another, and then to us, and then we try to deliver it to the end user as fast as possible, and that's how it can happen that you can actually receive the score faster in the app than on the TV screen. And we actually had a feature request from our, 
it's actually a quite common feature request from our users. Can you please um, slow down with the notification because it's it's too fast and it's you have to kind of balance if we are gonna do it or not because we do care about speed. <laughs> So people get disappointed if it happens before. Yeah, TV. so they want to they want to follow, but don't want to get the the scores that fast. I was impressed. I was on a stadium. First once. world problems. Yeah, first world problems. Like, too. oh my god, it ruined my watching experience. Like, I was uh, I was at a stadium once, and I literally got the notification as the goal happened. So that's pretty impressive. Um, so the industry is huge. You mentioned some competitors. Um, how fierce the competition in your space is? How many competitors are there? Where are they from? Are they better funded? Uh, are they big companies, supported by big companies? I'm sure there's American players in game. There must be some other Europeans. What's the situation there? Yeah, so, so there's a lot of competition going on. When we started, which was 13 years ago, there was a lot of competitions also uh, at that time. Uh, that number has just grown um, in the years that followed. So the competition is fierce because all of the apps are basically free. And we kind of all work more or less with the same data. Once you get to a certain point that when you have enough money to buy all of the streams, then you work with the same data. Um, so you, you have to see how you can optimize the app to be as fast as possible um, and to kind of give the users um, an incentive on why they should use you and not the others. Um, in terms of the ranking, so I think we are in the third place right now. So the biggest one is LiveScore. Um, and they have been here since the dawn of time. Um, they're a huge player, uh, but their issue was, as is with most companies that start early, they just stopped innovating at a certain point in time. Um, so that's when we saw our, our chance kind of to do it, to do it better. We, for example, we were the first app that allows you to track live live results that implemented push notifications. So at, at that point in time, you, you had a limit of 200 notifications per day. So 200K per day. And now we send 200 million push notifications per day. So the, the technology at that time wasn't on the level it is now. We, we couldn't do that. What, what we do today, we couldn't do that um, 10 years ago. But we were the first one to do it. So that's kind of what um, uh, differentiated us from the competition. Um, but yeah, there's like you, there's nothing stopping you to start your company today and see what you can do better. You mentioned data, and once you can afford all the data, I don't know if you can talk about this, but how expensive is this data? Like, how much of your budget goes to buy the data? Or roughly, like, I, I imagine it to be very expensive, but that's just me. It's like, um, it's less than 10%, more than 1%. It's not that I cannot talk about it, I'm just not sure. <laughs> um, uh, and and that's something you have to do. So um, we do negotiate with the data providers to kind of, keep the price reasonable. Um, what we can influence is, for example, other expenses. So um, the infra cost, so the, the, the cost of our servers um, that we have to pay, uh, it's really, really optimized. Um, and it's a, it's a tricky thing to do. So innovation and cost optimization, they are two different things. You cannot do them both, so one will suffer. So what we do is we switch between innovation and cost optimization regularly so we can keep the cost down and also innovate at the same time. Because, I mean, if you think about it, if you only uh, start um, cutting costs everywhere, then R&D is the thing that suffers. And if you only do R&D um, and you don't have investors' money, then you have a problem because you can run out of the money, so you have to keep it in Did balance. Did you ever consider fundraising? Yeah, so the... No. Okay. <laughs> That's I a mean, great answer. Yes and no. Yeah. Um, we didn't because we were profitable from day one. Um, although you kind of um, keep thinking, what if we did? Could we have gotten better, more users or whatever? 
Um, but the thing with, with other people's money is you focus on building a product which is good. But if you don't focus on also keeping it sustainable, then you get to a point where it's just too expensive to run a product and you're too far in the future to optimize. So I think it's a really important thing to, you have to focus on building out the product, but you also need to, step, uh, need to take a step back every now and again and see um, if you can do this better. There's a good quote like, the premature optimization is the root of all evil. And I completely agree with that. You, you, don't, you, you cannot do premature optimization, but you have to do it sometimes. Yeah, that's a very valuable lesson for all you founders that are uh, they're debating about fundraising and bootstrapping in reference to the unicorn game show questions that we had before. Uh, there was, that was one of the questions. Uh, okay, quick question for the audience. Who, I can't really see well, but who here is from Zadar? Okay, not so many, but some. And then a very easy question, who's the most famous person from Zadar? Like anyone? Yeah, Modric, yeah, yeah, that's good. That was, I expected more people to know that. Uh, so, so far I had, uh, had, a, had a thing, uh, a love affair with Luca. Uh, what happened there? Give us a background. Like, I uh, just a little bit of a background story. I mean, you guys know Croatia is a small place. I travel a lot, and I can tell you Morocco, Ghana, Kenya, Brazil, like literally anywhere. Singapore, you go, you say Croatia. What's the next thing that people say? Modric, that's it. Like, exactly. except Japan where it's crock up. But other than that, yeah. it's, and now even in Japan is Modric because people are getting old. But like, and, and it's pretty insane. So you, he became a brand ambassador or what's the relationship between you and Luca? How did this happen? And why are you convincing Luca to come to Shift next year? Tell us all about it. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's a good, that's a good idea. This is, this is a <laughs> billion a good... dollar idea. I'm doing this. Yeah. This. It's just that the career started. He should go to, you know, Saudi yeah, Arabia. We should have done this before so I could have brought him. Uh, but yeah, he's, uh, he's currently still our brand ambassador. Um, and it happened kind of naturally uh, where we are, we are at a point where we have started thinking about more about the brand and um, on our presence in, in Croatia and in the world. And Luca was kind of a natural fit because if you think about him as a football player in, in regards to all other football players, he's kind of this benign figure which is universally liked, I think. Like, I haven't heard a single bad thing about him. When you, when you speak to the fans, right, they all love him. And he's also from Croatia, and it was kind of a no-brainer to see if we can um, have some sort of um, some sort of business together. Um, and he was up for it, um, and it was uh, it was a cool story. He's a cool guy. I've met him, and our founders met him. He came to our office, and he's like, it's it's difficult to describe. If you haven't met him, he's really this down-to-earth, normal kind of guy. So. And uh, do you bump his votes on Sofa just because he's a brand ambassador? <laughs> so, yeah, we have two people which uh, our fans are always fighting about. It's Luca and Messi oh. because they receive higher votes than uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. And, it, like, we have this grading system built into the app where we each, uh, each player gets a rating based on um, their objective performance in the field and we take those 200 metrics per player and then we run it through the algorithm and it spits out a rating which is a number from 3 to 10 um, and Messi consistently gets higher scores than Ronaldo and also Modric gets really consistently high, high grades so people are always fighting uh, on why do we keep getting those players higher scores yeah, but Luca plays in serious leagues as opposed to Messi and Ronaldo. So, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but like on, on one hand, like I guess this is for Luca. Huh? <laughs> um, yeah, speaking of the scores, that's also super interesting. I don't want to dive too much. I'm sure a lot of people have here, and we are going to have questions afterwards. But so the traditionally, this is a really interesting digital transformation story. When I was a kid reading newspapers, you had this. I don't know. Let's take football, of course. You had this grade six, six and a half, seven. 
and it was usually the you know the new the reporter from the local paper, the sports reporter. I don't know, in Split was Ed of Petsi, you know, in Zagreb was someone else. And then they were like giving these grades, obviously based on their knowledge and expertise, but also probably based on their subjective vision of following 22 players on a field. It's pretty hard. Yeah. And now you have 200 metrics that you put into this. What, how much R&D you put into this? And I'm sure, and I remember at the World Cup, there was wars between the apps about, uh, I think you had Harry Maguire in the, in the, in, in the team of the championship. Which no, I mean, you know, it's co it's controversial, yeah. but like, how do you how do you uh, how do you how do you know that your metric is better than the other one, or that your scoring system is better than the other one, and you know, how much are you willing to bet it? Like, b go behind it. Yeah. So um, the the old way it was done is basically um, people did it by hand, um, and it's one person cannot follow that many players and, and it's it has a inherently it, it built in subjectiveness um, because you, you just cannot do it on your own um, and that's why what we set out to kind of solve to have an algorithm that will do it um, the same way for all of the players um, and it's this the algorithm itself is obviously subjective to what we think is important it um, has certain coefficients that uh, take into account different metrics and score some of the metrics more than others. Um, and it was in R&D for more than a year. I think a year and a half is how long it was. The initial version was... Do you revise it? Do you, yeah, 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 exactly. So we also have this partnership with, with um, Academia where we kind of see how it's behaving over time, and then they have their own um, ideas on if it can be improved, and we iterate all the time and, and tweak it a little bit. You cannot change it a lot. I mean, it doesn't even make sense to change it a lot because then it's no longer the same algorithm, but we do tweak it um, uh, from time to time. When you see some edge cases where you see, okay, objectively, this should have been a higher grade, then we kind of try to see why it wasn't, and see if we can improve it in the future. Um, and also, as a side note, uh, as an anecdote, we had like the 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 rating itself is based on on um, statistical uh, uh, results that we have for each player, and you can have a mistake in the statistics, so a number of uh, shots or misses or whatever. And we had this one guy, a Croatian guy. A footballer, football player, who contacted our support and said, you guys have this statistic wrong, my statistic is wrong, and this is influencing my rating on your app, and that's influencing my career because the transfer window is coming up, and my value is based on that because we have an inside info that like um, teams are actually looking at this rating to see which players are performing are better and which are worse. So you're literally, that's actually a great segue. We're running out of time slowly. We'll have questions, don't worry. But like the segue into my last maybe question. Uh, so you expect like scouts are looking into it, maybe managers, the statistics. What's next? Do you see a new business line for you in the future? Like expanding into, I mean, obvious options are maybe betting, ticketing, uh, B2B with, you know, scouts, sports club and stuff like this. Do you see going maybe... Uh, crypto token in now just may do you see maybe going in one of those directions yeah so th there's a lot of we have a lot of ideas for for the current app and we have even more ideas for what we could do next um, it, we will do something I'm not sure what because the plan is not there yet and we are exploring different avenues but it will definitely be something that's in this domain um, and you are completely right all, all of those things are possible we will not do crypto. <laughs> I, th I think it doesn't make sense for our for our domain. Uh, but there's a lot of things you can you can do. Um, I'm hoping to avoid betting, just because it's a tricky thing if you have to deal with money on your platform. Um, so we we don't we don't receive any payments um, on the platform. Everything is uh, being financed from the ads, and I would like to keep it that way to kind of. 
um, go around the, the money issue. But yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of things that are possible. Did you consider sending all the notifications about scores via SMS? That's no, just uh, <laughs> we might we might do something. Uh, <laughs> it's like. Uh, all right, questions. We're out of time, but I think there is a break next, so we can go a little bit over. Uh, does anyone have questions? I always say Croatian people are very shy when it comes to questions, but prove me wrong. There is one there in the back. There's a mic coming with the unicorn slippers. Uh, do I need to stand up? Okay. Uh, Marco here from Evona, working in betting. Uh, I want to ask, how do you handle a possible... Uh, like uh, differences uh, when data come in from your providers. For example, if you have two providers watching the same game and they send different data, how do you handle, who do you trust more? Do you have like trust levels for providers or something? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question actually. I mean, we do have um, more than 30 different sources of data. So it's, it's tricky to do so. We have priorities uh, that are just handpicked by us because we want to be as fast as possible. Uh, but sometimes mistakes do happen and we have a built-in failsafe in the system which can switch between who is the most important for this match. Um, but usually the data is uh, aggregated in a, in a way that it's, um, it's filling the gaps we have from other providers. For, for example, we have a really fast data provider which we use for scores and then we have a slower one for deep statistics and stuff like that and we have some providers that we have to get a quorum from, from. so when two of them say it's okay then we say it's okay so you, you, you kind of aggregate on that level but that's slower so you, ha you have to pick and choose um, fortunately for our users um, speed is the most important thing so um, they are fine with it if we sometimes have a change in the score when we ha say that this didn't actually happen, so we cancel the goal and, and uh, roll it back. Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, I did a recently a project that is uh, close to what you do. And you called your session Moneyball Generation. Uh, what do you think? Uh, how far are we now from the goal I think all the professional teams hope? Uh, to help them uh, be better when buying players, choose, choosing they, them by their statistics and making less uh, errors in that, that process. Uh, my, my personal opinion is that we are not that close to that, especially in football, which is a much more complex uh, game de than, for example, baseball. Uh, be careful there. I was very close. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, would, I would tend to agree. Um, I think we are not still there yet. Um, in the future, Anything is possible, uh, but the current technology and what we do um, is just, you don't have enough data to do it completely objectively. And I'm not sure if it even can be completely objective. Um, there's this thing called player value um, where there, there, there are a lot of different um, streams that you have to take into account when you, um, try to figure out their, their value, the, the merchandise you can sell of them. And it's not just how good they play, it's how, they, how the fans respond to the players. But you also miss out all the, if, you, if you're talking about how to estimate the, the value of the player, not just on, in terms of monetization, but of actual playing, like all the psychology factors, you know, you know, we have a lot of, we've seen a zillion stars that have amazing statistics at yeah. 18 and then got injured by the way, or, you know, not really strong athletes in like mind wise and stuff like this and then they disappear like that's also yeah, yeah so I mean, that's pretty what, hard. what you can do what is obviously being done today is you can predict which team has a higher chance of winning which is just what betting companies do and then they do it quite well obviously yeah but ideally we would like to be able to choose next luka modric by the statistics when, uh, that he had when he was for example 18. Yeah, uh, so, uh, okay. 
One, one more comment. I think uh, Cristiano Ronaldo uh, gets lower grades because those people that are, cl that are clicking the, on the screen are too slow because he's too, he's too fast for them, you know. <laughs> I know which way you swing in that debate. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah. th that's a good point on, on following the players before they get uh, professional. We are actually doing something in this regard. We want to have all of the games that are being played that have a referee. Um, to be available on the platform. Um, so we are working with lower leagues um, to allow them to um, kind of uh, record that data for free on our platform. And then we, they have the ability to um, dispatch it worldwide to all of our users. Um, and it's a win-win situation because they have a platform where they can track that. We have more data uh, that comes with different challenges that we have to solve but we want to have as much data um, about players and matches as possible. I mean, it would be really cool if you could go and see for Luka Modric since his early days, how he played, how he performed. And if you have deep stats, you can see how he developed over the years. I mean, I think that's a really cool thing to be able to do. And we're working towards enabling that. Uh, I think we're really, really over time. I have a quick, quick series of questions for the end, uh, I'm pretty sure you can see Yossip around. If I'm, I, like, I have more questions, so I'll, I'll catch him later. But uh, you can see Yossip around. You can play basketball at the Selfa Score booth. After all, so, uh, Zadar is the city of basketball. Great branding there. Uh, but like, uh, last series of very quick questions. Then we almost took all the time of the break, I can see right now. Uh, very quick choices for you. And you just have to answer one of the two. Handball or basketball? Basketball. All right, rugby or American football, be very careful. American football. Chase him off. Win some, lose some. Um, uh, yeah, uh, but then uh, 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 baseball or golf, I have more questions. Baseball or golf? Football, yeah. Golf. Interesting. Leo Messi or Luka Modric? Luka Modric, that's uh, like... Leo Messi. I'm, I'm, I'm offended you even asked that. I, I knew the answer. But Cristiano or Leo? Cristiano or? Or Messi. Or me Messi. I'm sorry. Like, this is last but not least. So I'm from Rijeka. I'm a Rijeka fan. I'm sorry. But last question for you, probably Dinamo or Hajduk. Well, uh, yeah, it's not an a... easy question. <laughs> <laughs> so. No, no, we no time, no yeah, time. Yeah, we have to go. Remember, we are in Zadar, okay? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? that's, that's why it's difficult. I'm from Zagreb, so I have to say Dinamo. All right, <laughs> All right thank you, everyone. Give us a round of applause. <laughs>